Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, and welcome to yet another Pure Digital Passion Podcast with Moses Kemibaro. And today I have guests uh, from HID, which is a global identity company, uh, providing services across Africa with different organizations. Thank you very much for joining us, Colin and Natasha. So this morning, I'd like to maybe start with you, Colin. Um, you're here, obviously, for this big conference with the ID for Africa. Indeed. And I'd like to maybe give us your origin story, Let's a bit of your personal background, uh, some of the key moments that led to your career working in international trade and document design. Yes, so um, it's a long time ago now, Moses, but I, um, I started off in Central St. Martins, London University, and studying fine art and portraiture. Okay. Uh, which was a real, yeah, really fascinated me because I love to connect with the the human face. Okay, There's a real power um, looking into the eyes of uh, and connecting with with the humanity in that sense. And so to to draw and sketch um, people really fascinated me. And um, I never at that time imagined that um, that this would go on to um, my first part of my career in, in banknote design. But um, but indeed, those opportunities opened up later on after university. And how's that going so far? Yeah, so um, so really, re really fascinating and, and interesting. Um, from uh, after uh, university, I was going to pursue a journalism career. I love writing and um, had already traveled a little bit around the world. Okay. Um, and so interested in exploring different cultures and, um, and just... Um, global events, um, current affairs has always been an interest of mine as well. Yeah. So, um, so on the on the back of that, I um, after after university, um, my, my English teacher actually um, had a, a colleague who was working for a company called Harrison and Sons in okay. London. Okay. And uh, and there was an opportunity to go to the company and work with them for a week. Um, and I didn't really know what uh, what that involved as such. I'd heard that they were doing some postage stamps mm -hmm. and working with King Charles on um, on some castle uh, drawings that he yes. had developed. Anyway, I went in. I did my did my week with them, and they were just emerging and breaking into the banknote world okay. and designing banknotes. And so I sat with um, some an incredibly talented um, men and women, uh, just a. a Five, five of them, very niche um, sector in, in banknote design. Um, two of the men involved in there were exhibiting in the Royal Academy of Art. One of them was painting these fine miniature portraits. And, and I just was, just in that one week, was so fascinated in this world that I had never, never seen or, or never understood. And, and suddenly a banknote that I would probably you know, ignored in the past, the detail and the design, um, became something far more interesting to me. Fantastic. Awesome. So maybe we'll move to you, Natasha. You can tell us maybe a little bit more about what HID does as a business, you know, globally. Sure. You do have an impressive footprint. And I think partly why we're here today is because I've encountered your brand when I'm doing my um, internet banking. I've seen that you provide security within that, even in Kenya. And I'm just curious to understand a little bit about your background, what you do as an organization globally, but also uh, what you're doing within the East African region. We have dropped the global name a couple of uh, months ago, actually. So HID is an identity solution provider um, located in the U.S. But we have offices around the world, in Africa, in APAC, in Europe, uh, Latin America. Uh, we belong to Asa Abloy, which is one of the biggest door-opening companies in the world, actually. Um, a Swedish one. Um, and, yeah, we enable people to access things freely and travel safely um, basically we so if we take the life of a person for example yes um, so a child is born you need to you need to register the birth of this child somewhere so we do a CRVS system for example which is a civil registry uh, system so where you kind of um, register all the important life events of a person, yeah? So let's start there, and then um, that birth is registered once, this person will grow up at some point, it will start uh, school, it will need uh, maybe a uh, student ID, um, so we provide the printers to print that, we provide the cards, um, the chips for that, um, chip operating systems, um, then maybe that person will drive a car 
it will need a driving license exactly. it will need uh, to access a building to work or the university it will uh, work maybe in a sector where you need to track things yeah like like animals maybe you know these little tracking devices yes, that they yes. the clips in the ears of cows Correct. and stuff like this yeah so that's also something that we do so we are really i we yeah our company helps identify things and identify verify and authenticate people things and places and this is really interesting because it seems to me that you cut across very many use cases it's yes. not just one thing but what is the key importance of that you know identity as a as a requirement or possibly the digital identity in this case that you know from someone's birth all the way presumably to their death you're able to sort of provide identity across different scenarios uh, why is that so important well our business area where me and Colin work specifically uh, we focus on citizen identity meaning the citizen how the citizen identifies towards the government yes and um why is that so important because without an identity without having a legal identity you cannot access any public services yeah yes. um from the government which means if the government never knows for example that you ever existed you can't attend school yeah well wow. you you can't uh, open a bank account if you can't open a bank account you are not able to uh, to rent a house if you can't rent a house you cannot get an employment contract and and it is a vicious circle uh, you know if 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 you don't have that basis the basic legal identity and it doesn't necessarily have to be a document it can be a fingerprint it can be um you know it depends how you define identity then yeah but um but it is very crucial in order to have access to all these things in life and if you know many of us are very privileged and don't even think about the effects of what happens when you don't have that indeed well, and and also with healthcare yes i mean to have this id then that allows you to to have that provision as well and i think probably one of the the best things i suppose is that you're able to sort of interconnect or provide identity across different government uh, services using a singular setup i presume yes i mean that depends on on the government um very often so we yes. enable we empower governments to help citizens access a better future this is kind of our mission as a, as a business yeah. area yeah um and then it depends how the government sets that up yeah is the government um moving to a more digital infrastructure yeah or it does it provide national identity uh, cards or do you identify yourself with a mobile drive with a mobile id yeah so that really depends but we do offer the entire portfolio around that fantastic colin i'll come back to you uh, you have a rich history designing government documents and passports including the award winning Estonian and UK passport. It's not every day that I interview someone who's <laughs> award winning. Uh so congratulations on that. Thank you. Could you talk us through your design process and how you approach designing something that not only needs to be functional but also carries the identity of a person? Yes, um so th- the beginning of it is to to sit down with the customer and I always start off with the question what does your country mean to you? And because I want to explore um that theme because they 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 have a head start on me by being a national so i spend a day um asking those sort of questions um giving them time to think and my notebook is full and then i'm kind of ready to begin to explore some of those themes of course um often you're going to get a a feeling that it's going to be designed by committee because everyone's going to have an mm. opinion design is very subjective yes and and so there's lots of voices i like to give space and time to allow for the the quieter voice also because they might have a great idea and also i encourage wild ideas because you know no idea um is out out of the question so um and that's a really great learning process for me as well to engage with the customer from whatever country they're at they're in living in and uh to find out more about that country then from that time i normally have two or three days where i go off and travel myself i'm a photographer as well so okay. i will capture a lot of my own images um within those 3 or 4 days and try and travel as ex- extensively as i can um to uh just to be immersed in in that country um from that uh um from then i go i go back and start coming up with some conceptual designs uh-huh um 
Oft, often I can be confident enough to pitch one or two designs because that workshop has been so thorough that I've gauged by then quite you know, a good indication of what the, uh, what the client or the customer wants. Um, so, but but there, within our industry, a lot of ID documents, currency can be very traditional. Mm. And I'm a modernist and I like to kind of break and push those boundaries. So, uh, but nevertheless, uh, some customers, you know, they want to err on the side of caution. Yeah. And therefore, they still want to have some of those traditional values in their, in their document. So I offer one with a little bit, you know, it's tempered back a little bit more. It's a, a little bit more traditional, mm. uh, but there's still an edge to it and, and some modern um, themes introduced. And then I uh, and then I offer something um, far more um, thinking out of the box and 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 very modern. And um, from that stage, uh, because even in that stage, incidentally, um, because that's the aesthetic, you know, that's the that that's the theme, the thematic of the book. But even at that stage, I'm thinking because of my 28, 30 years experience in ID design. I'm thinking how you will build the, the you know, there's a real science in, in our, yes. our um, work. And so, so I'm already thinking how, we'll, how we can build the security within, the, within that process and within those designs. So then I would go back normally to the, uh, to the country or send my, my designs through, get some initial feedback, yep. sit around a table again. It's all about collaboration. This is what HID Global do, do so well, I believe, because we sit and we don't pitch we listen and so i go back I, you have to have thick skin as a designer because mm. you know there's a lot of critique but you learn from critique i sit down i, I listen but you also have to be confident in your own abilities because um, you, if you've come up with a design that you're pleased with and it's based on some of the themes and ideas that the customer has given you, uh, then you can stay you know, strong to that and, uh, and that's what I do. So once hopefully one of those concepts uh, are agreed, and that's not always the case, sometimes you have to go back and you know, um, redo parts of it. Uh, it's unlikely after a workshop that you'd have to start again. Um, so once that part is finished, uh, which can be between one, two, and three months, uh, then you start to take it to the next level. We get those concepts signed off, and then we begin to develop the secure stage where we um, use a program called Corvina software. Mm -hmm. It's been developed in, in Hungary by JSP Jira. Um, it's only available to central banks and security um, companies, security print companies. Um, it's, um, it's worth millions, um, even the license itself, hundreds of thousands of pounds per license, per wow. um, computer. And you have to have years of training. I mean, I started training in this software in 1998. And, uh, and have been involved actually going back to Budapest with them, talking about how with the software developers of, of things that we would like to see uh, in the future and, and enhancements that we can see in, in, in the documents. And so, and so that's the next stage. It's a, it's a stage of taking that imagery, whether it's an abstract design, whether it's more um, based around topography or photographic images, whatever it is, we then will secure that with line modulations, watermarks. I don't even know what that means. No, no. So this is a, yeah, this is a, yeah, a whole different world. And this is why when I do, did the talk yesterday, for example, um, at ID for Africa, people suddenly pay attention to what's in their document because it, and, unless they see in detail what goes into a, a passport, then people are never aware. They're, not, they're often not aware of the subject matter. But then when you look at the detail, that goes into those books, they're, 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 there's a real interest and fascination in, in, into that as well. A because passport actually, sorry, yeah, just jumping yeah, in, a passport yeah. is actually um, made out of more than 40 components. So you don't really realize that and the amount of artwork that goes into that. So when he talks then about the artwork that needs to be introduced into a security concept, it basically means that, you know, if you take your, a magnifier, for example, and look at the document, you can see that... Um, 
there are little words written that you cannot see with a pure eye, for example, yeah? So you have a tree, for example, that is the pure art, but the branches of the tree will then, in a security concept, will have little words, for example, and maybe there's a little mistake in that word, so that if someone wants to forge that document, they would need to replicate and know exactly that this word is, for example, written wrong in that space. Well. Um, and this is really hard, right? Because you can't really know a document so well. Um, and these little secrets are all over this document, basically, yeah? using different inks, different technologies to create security around it and security features that have been once just a design concept. Yeah, I find it fascinating because on one hand, I think the way the process starts is very creative. Yeah, it starts off with the, that immersion in the in the in the, in the country yes. and the philosophies and yes. the ethos, and then you sort of take start from that point and now gradually get all the way down to the fact that the security and the design are actually integrated and yes. and, and they come together. Yes, and then of course that's backed by the you know the proprietary technologies that allow you to then verify and validate yes. that this yes. passport is indeed authentic. Yes, yes and exactly. And I think I mentioned earlier today when we were having a conversation that I do happen to have a passport that I believe has your uh, security chip, and also the fact that when you do go through uh, immigration, the way it streamlines that process for you, the fact that it's it's smooth and 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 you know sort of unconstrained. Maybe you can talk a little bit about that, Natasha, if, sure. if you like to, yeah. Yeah, I mean, um, first of all, yes, we actually do the Kenyan passport at the moment, and Colin has actually designed it, right? So, yes, yes. so um, yeah, so we have a lot of experience there. Um, a good design is also a design that is easily usable at a border, for example. And that always depends how a country is set up in that kind of sense. Yeah, Do you have a manual border control? So where you have a border control officer sitting, for example, who will inspect your document and read certain information out of it. Or you have sometimes also automatic border control systems Correct, yeah. where you can just go through the border with your passport very easily. Yeah, um, So... In order to be able to do that, you do need an e-passport. Correct. Um, so, you know, if, if how do you know you have an e-passport? So if, if you look at the cover, there's usually a gold embossing of the country's emblem or something like this. And then down uh, underneath that, you see a little camera sign. Uh -huh. So um, that means that it is an e-passport, meaning that there is a chip somewhere in that document, mostly in the cover or in the da data page, Yeah, okay. which is where we, the page where all the personal information is hold, yeah, the picture of the document holder and so on. So, um, yeah, and that facilitates, obviously, the um, border control because the chip is red and then you can just, um, and the machine is comparing the information and the pictures because you have on the chip, you actually have the biometric information, like the fingerprint, for example, is stored, yeah? So that, or a picture of the passport holder. So then the facial camera comes usually at the border control and like takes you, uh, takes your picture, compares it to the one in the chip and in the document, and then lets you through it, yeah? But it's, this is kind of the digital um, security on the document, which yeah. is why a lot of countries are moving now to e-passport. We have also moved a lot of African countries to e-passport, actually. There are still a couple of countries that are trying to do that or wanting to do that in the future, and we really hope to be able to support them. Um, but, yeah, that's just the digital component to it. Forgery is always also catching up somehow, yeah? So that's why we do encourage countries to, to uh, redesign their documents every at least 10 years, yeah? Because um, as... As much as innovation is happening in that sector, also people that shouldn't be able to to replicate certain things just catch up on technology, right? So, I mean, cyber threats or, or identity theft have not been the case uh, a couple of uh, years ago, you know? Yeah. So, so obviously, threat is always coming. Um, and yeah, so... Physical yeah, design is really important as well. Yeah. Okay, definitely. And just to um, touch on that that part of the the counterfeiting, um, I have the privilege to work with uh, NDFU, which is National Fraud Identity, in London, and they um, find any of the worldwide. This is globally any of the counterfeits, passports or ID documents that are discovered, uh, whether that's at the immigration desk or in an airport, uh, wherever that may be, 
and brought back to London to, to analyze. And so I sit in um, a workshop with those for, for a day and we look at where, they, the, where those uh, specific th um, documents have been targeted. And this is, a, th this is enormously helpful for me as a designer because of course then I can see where the potential threat is. And, ah, and okay. more and more in a document it would be in the, on the buyer data page. And because uh, a counterfeiter doesn't want to spend an entire month or a year even trying to counterfeit every single page. So what we've been seeing in the industry, and this has been a real change and a shift over the last five, ten years, is page substitution, uh -huh. where they will literally just take out the, the buyer data page, uh, which has been stitched in. So they will carefully unstitch it and replace it with a, a, a different um, buyer data page, because of course then they don't have to replicate the entire book or indeed the, the page itself. And so to counteract that and, and to enhance what Natasha was saying, the, the polycarbonate page is the not only one. Yeah, the plastic one is, is not only held in with stitching, um, we, we, we put in different safeguards within that to, to um, counter the threat of page substitution. For example, HID Global use something called SafeLink, which is a UV, two working UV um, color. Uh, which goes onto that, that uh, biodata page into something called the hinge. The hinge is what holds that page now into the book and it actually goes um, behind the spine of the book so you can see the fold the other side. I should e have brought a passport. Yeah, huh? yeah. yeah. Any counterfeiter that tries to, um, to, try to tamper now that tamper thing. with that page um, you can you can instantly see that, that that has been tampered with, either by seeing that the the um, security print has, has has now changed, or indeed the hinge itself. Wow, I'll never look at my passport the same way again. <laughs> no, never, ever, ever. Um, so I'd like to come back to you, Natasha, and I think you know you're obviously in Nairobi. You're here this week for the ID for Africa conference, which I believe is ending today, and I'd just like to understand a little bit more about why HID is here for this event, why you're uh, participating and more importantly, um, going forward, what does that mean for HID possibly in East Africa and Africa? Um, yeah, ID for Africa is a is is a show, a trade show, which is held once a year uh, in a different African country. So it's really focused on on the African continent. Um, last year it was in Morocco. This year it is in Nairobi, and I believe next year it will be in South Africa. Okay. Um, and for us. Obviously, and for the entire market, um, it is it is a very important market, Africa. Yeah, because um, as I mentioned, a lot of countries have already moved to e-passport, but there are always enhancements to just keep up to date. Yeah, with the newest technologies and the threats that are coming. That ne so you always need to be working on the next generation, basically. Yeah, but also. There are still a couple of countries who have not made that step to e-passport, yeah. And then you know, do you do you want to facilitate travel in a way to implement uh, border control solutions? You know, do you want to? We do have biometric enrollment devices, for example. How can they facilitate maybe border control as well? You know, if, when you travel to some countries, you, they capture your fingerprints. So that's also something that we are doing, for example. Um, it is not needed in Europe, for example, because uh, within the Schengen area, of course, you can just travel freely. But I believe in Africa, for example, this is still happening in many yeah. countries. Yeah. So, um, so, yeah. And then obviously, I think there's a... Yeah, I think Africa has so much economic growth potential and in order to be growing economically you do need a reliable identity you do need to have trust and that's not only for the individual but for businesses they no need to know that the person that maybe they work with the person that they hire um, the products they buy you know that all that all these interactions are based on the knowledge that it is what it is or mm -hmm. the person is who he is. So if you don't have that trust, you cannot, um, yeah, there can no, not be a prosperity really in, in, in business, yeah. So it is, identity in general is a basic uh, requirement for economic growth, yeah. And I think we see that people want to travel more as well in Africa, so streamlining these processes, 
uh, processes is also really important. And yeah, so I think there are a lot of opportunities here yeah, to, to make the life of, of, of the private sector and for citizens just uh, easier in many ways. Great. Colin, I'd like to come back to you. So you've been recognized for your work on the Kenyan passport and many other African passports as well. And I'd like to maybe hear from you in terms of what are the unique challenges you face you know, doing this kind of work in Africa and possibly how do you see that affecting the, the whole area of identity and the citizens um, that are using your products uh, throughout Africa? Well, um, I started off my career, as I said, in banknote design and I remember designing the, uh, the Kenya shilling uh, in 1992, with um, His Excellency uh, Daniel Moy. Wow! And uh, so that, that's that far good. back, huh? Yeah, that's wow. that far back. I know I don't look quite that old, <laughs> but um, but yeah. So um, and even th then, there were there were some challenges. Of course, I've mentioned uh, earlier about design by committee. Lots of lots of different opinions. Um, I then went on to design the the Kenya uh, passport. Um, I think it's uh, certainly in, in Africa, in East Africa, the, the country is so diverse. There's so much subject matter. I touched on this in, in my talk yesterday um, in ID for Africa. And, and this is why these, these workshops are so important. But more and more, I, I like to have a narrative running through a passport, a story, um, rather than trying to capture everything, because this is a real challenge in a book. Um, Often less is more is a current mm. trend that we're seeing in passports. And, and yet governments, presidents, they often, they're so excited and passionate and proud of their nation that they want to represent it as a whole. And I can understand that because, you, you, you know, you've got marginalized people. You might want to, you know, in, you want to be inclusive. Um, but at the same time, the, by trying to do that, you open up a whole can of worms, and uh, because you're already, you know, you're going to miss out something or someone. Um, hence, why we often use wildlife. In the case of the uh, the, the Kenya passport, which um, is now due an upgrade, I believe, and that's what we we talked about yesterday. But we looked at the the big five. One of the challenges in design is, of course. The big five, I, I've seen them on the South African currency. And so how do we look at that? How can we do something a little bit different? Um, I wanted uh, the Kenyan people to recognize these animals, the, the lion and the elephant um, and, and the water buffalo. Mm -hmm. But in the same sense, I wanted the, there to be some more subtle undertones in mm -hmm. the design. So we put in the background the hide or the fur of that creature hidden in the detail um, in the background of, of that passport. Yesterday, when I made the address, I don't think there were any Kenyans, Kenyans in the audience who had ever noticed that element oh. of, de of detail in there. Despite, all, uh, of course, having had those um, conversations and, and some of those ideas being being agreed. Um, so I think some of the like the, for, for me now the um, after having two back-to-back -back work workshops with the Minister of the Interior here in Kenya um, when they flew across to the UK with me and we looked at in depth of some of the emerging um, things that are happening in Kenya. I think the greatest challenge will be now finding a, a, a narrative, a subject that, that represents Kenya. Something fresh, something something new, um, because there's, there's actually too much choice. You're renowned for athletics, for example. Mm -hmm. You could do an entire book just on long distance running. Why not? Why not have each page with somebody yeah. running through, through the book? You're renowned for now um, women empowerment. You, you could tell an entire story around that or, or you know, the way that you're building on infrastructure here through, throughout East Africa. So uh, these are some of the things that are, uh, are now I'm beginning to think about in my head and how we can develop the next book. And again, you have to sort of cherry pick, you know, what is you representative do. of the times, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, I know that the running and maybe the coffee, the tea, uh, the animals is all somewhat a little bit cliche at this point. Yes. But there are also these emerging things, especially in my line of work, which is technology. Yes. Uh, where we're seeing, you know, Kenya is now called the Silicon Savannah. Right. It's known as the home of mobile money. You know, these are sort of becoming endemic or very clearly... Uh, defining Kenya as a pioneer within the African space. So I can imagine the, the, the sort of the challenge you have, therefore, to kind of see like what represents the times of, of Kenya today and how does that then 
become visible in the eventually the passport that we're going to have. Yeah, well, you've just given me another two insights, <laughs> Moses, and another two ideas. I need to include you in the, in the next design oh, workshop. Yeah. yeah, we're very yeah, proud absolutely. of that reputation. The technology side of things, fantastic. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and rightly so. And, and you know, as, as, as you said, I mean, that could be a subject that we could explore as, as a whole. And actually, the current president, uh, His Excellency uh, President Ruto, uh, recently there was an event where they were launching a new fintech product called Fingo. And it's, you know, 24 years old. The founders are 24 years old and they've launched this thing with uh, uh, Echo Bank, which is one of the largest banks across the continent. And he was very, very adamant that he wants to sort of prioritize the youth, uh, what he likes to call the, the hustler nation. Yes. Well, building technologies, building opportunities for young people. So, you know, it might be a great opportunity, mm -hmm. I think, to sort of showcase that, you know, for the next 10 years, you know, yes. as it were, because uh, it is definitely an area where there's a great deal of momentum in, in Kenya, but also across the African continent. Yes, uh, yes. So he yeah. touched on that yesterday and talking about empowering the youth, and that's something that we're really passionate about yeah. at HID Global as well. Yeah. And if I can involve the youth and talk to them and hear from their level exactly. what their expectations would be in a new document, I think that would be a really fresh perspective Absolutely. as well. Yeah. We have done something similar. I mean, it was after the passport launch, but... Um, in Bahrain, we yes. did went to the university and presented the passport, for example, to a to art students and security wow. graphic students, architecture students. Fantastic. And that was just an amazing feedback that we got. Oh, right? incredible. At the yeah. end at the end of that, they were studying architecture, um, even economics. Um, and there were students coming up and saying, this has been life enhancing to know that we now can carry our new e-passport and be so proud that you've represented our pearling history, our governance, Fantastic. Um, the, the Formula One, all uh, of these yeah. things. And, 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 and having heard that we'd worked at the level with the Crown Prince as well and ha heard some of his opinions and included them in that book. Um, was so fascinating for them and definitely empowered them as well and, and I think gave them a real confidence and a belief that they can go on to do and more as well. Yeah, definitely. Fully represented, yeah. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. It can be quite tricky because actually Canada has just launched their new uh, passport design and it is always also a political decision, yeah? Mm. How do you want to show your, your country, yes. yeah? And um, in the media at least it was said that, that, you know, it represents more kind of the the past and not so much the future um so it 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 is you know it can be a tricky thing so finding that balance the heritage exactly. and, and the way forward you yes know? exactly yeah do you want to focus yeah. on that or that yeah and yeah. that really depends sometimes you know, on, on on the on the government how they see that how they think yeah okay maybe i'll come back to you natasha sure. i'd like to maybe ask a little bit more about hid identity solutions east africa kenya um what's in the market what are you bringing to market Maybe you can tell us a little bit more about that. We do offer the entire, basically, journey around a, a citizen's life um, and how they identify themselves throughout um, their life towards the government. And within that, we are building ID systems, for example, um, on, in Africa as well. We are collaborating with the governments um, to, to facilitate the access to identity identity through digitization basically yeah so for example for tanzania um we moved that country to an e-passport but we also reduced the touch points to actually get that identity document the passport by i think 55 percent so wow. before that you know very streamlined now very much more streamlined yeah because when when you have a country where the population does not necessarily live in the capital but all over the uh, area and the infrastructure sometimes maybe um is not as uh, built out then you you know it might take you four hours to get to the capital to to apply for your identity document whichever that is yeah and um if you have many, if that process is not streamlined enough, then it means that you might need to go first to apply, first to enroll, first to pay, you know, a second time to pay, a third time to go and get another signature, a fourth time to uh, collect it or to, you know, it really depends how, how the process goes. But um, that can be inconvenient and also lead to to people not wanting to do that, yeah, or not being able to do. I mean, you know, if you have a family, you work, you know, you, you have a busy life. You cannot yeah. you, you cannot travel these distances all the time to, to get an identity document. Yeah. yeah. But that at the end leaves you 
lacking something really important actually in your life. Yeah. So digitizing these processes and streamlining application processes, enrollment issuance processes around identity documents, this is something that we have done for for many countries and that we are you know doing for example for Tanzania as well. Um, and then I think the next step now is moving countries to possibly you no know, mobile identity. We have actually, I mean, it's not Africa, but um, we have implemented the first national mobile ID in Argentina, for example. Yeah. So, so, and we see a lot of countries around the globe, Africa. Uh, how does that at, work exactly, if I may ask? <laughs> um, yeah, they can, you know, they have a mobile a, a card on their phone. Okay. They can identify themselves towards the government with that. Yeah. They can access services with that. Um, this is using the SIM? Or? Yes. Okay. So it access the. It's an app. It's an oh, app it's on an the app phone. Okay. Yes, okay. Exactly. Okay. With all your, the required information. And we see, for example, also already countries, um, you know, uh, implementing that kind of um, um, processes for travel. You know, we oh, see okay. that, I mean, there are standard organizations around civil aviation. Okay. It's called ICAO, for example. It's in Montreal. Um, because as you might have noticed, every passport looks the same. So there's someone who says, to, who has to define that, yeah? That the picture is there, it has to be like this, the name is like this. And, all the and standards. All yeah. the standards, exactly, so that people can actually use that document. And that organization is also already looking into digital travel credentials, yeah? How can we travel without the physical identity document, you know, the, without the physical passport? Um, and there are some bilateral agreements that already facilitate or pilot programs but which are looking into that i think on a global level it will take a couple of years still you know and i don't i don't think that the physical document will become uh, unimportant but um yeah it is the next step i would say yeah and i think that evolution is inevitable because let's be honest the common denominator today is everyone has a smartphone yes exactly and most people even in kenya uh, are transitioning to smartphones yes. and i imagine that when you think about the computing power and the capabilities you know identity is obviously one of the things that it can do so i'm keen to see that and i imagine the likes of estonia which is very progressive must be already playing in that space right estonia is one of the most digitized uh, countries in terms of government services i think we once looked into um, into some studies. I think it was ninety nine percent or something like this of, wow. of, mm. of of government interactions are already digital. They already do also voting digitally and all kinds of things. Yes. So maybe I'd like to come back to you again, Colin, and you can share with us what are sort of the design trends you see when it comes to identity solutions. What is the the way forward? The next two to five years, perhaps. What are the trends going forward? What do you yeah. see happening? Yeah. yeah. So I um, certainly cross-page design. So by that, what do I mean? I mean, when you look at a visa page, the, 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 the center page is in a, in a book. Um, we, are, we are tending now to have the, the photograph image or whatever we're using cross-paging over the spine of the book. Uh -huh. So this is something that we've, we've introduced. Um, also, um, I, I believe less is more. So concentrating on maybe a, a purity within the book. And so looking at one subject, as we, as we mentioned, but not um, overcomplicating it, because you can still make a, a book very secure by keeping it uh, you know, simple in the sense of a photographic image or whether you use topography. This is another current trend that we're seeing, topography styles, different, uh, different fonts emerging, for mm. example. You could do a, a new passport design based around a font. In fact, when we did the, uh, the Estonia book, they had their own uh, font that we, that we implemented in, into the book. So this is, this is another idea. I think some of the other trends, uh, certainly with HID Global, what we're exploring is in the gold blocking. And Natasha has already mentioned that in the gold blocking, if you look at any document, uh, document at the moment, you'll see uh, a crest on the front and it'll be um, in this bold gold. Well, we're now looking and we've, we've um, experimented with it and we're ready to launch it, where you're looking at different um, gold blocking colors including white and blue. Uh, so you can, you can introduce those as a, as a trend onto, onto your front cover. Um, and then of course you on your end pages, you have what's called intaglio print. And intag end pages are the ones that are glued to the cover. Oh, okay, yes. Yeah. 
yeah, some, sometimes I assume you, yeah, of course, you know, <laughs> not being in our industry. It's, I don't uh, understand no, the subject matter. Right. <laughs> um, the, so the Intaglio print, it's, an, it's, a, it's a raised print. Okay. It's very difficult to counterfeit. There's things that you can hide within that print, um, things like a latent image where you hold that uh, printer at a certain angle and embedded and hidden into it is letters or, or, or yeah, a graphic, to, uh, for example. So in the Kenya book, we have the word Kenya hidden in, in the intaglio print. But we can explore more ideas around the intaglio, two and three color intaglio printing, um, which is a great uh, deterrent against counterfeiting. And so that's um, something that we're exploring as well. And to have that um, intaglio going over, the crossing once again beneath that spine. Man, I... I will never look at my passport the same again. <laughs> Honestly, I feel like I've just gone a, a mini MBA uh, on, on, on passport design and identity. Yeah, so I think we're coming to the end of our session. And I think uh, I'd like to come back to you again, Natasha. If you have any final remarks, anything you think that would be valuable to know uh, by our audience today. It's like Colin said, it's really great um, to look at your identity document. Um, look at it maybe from a from a more interested perspective, how much effort is going into it, val valuing the fact that you have that travel document, that you can travel freely and securely around the world, that you actually have an identity. Yeah. Um, these are important things that we don't appreciate, I think, sometimes enough in life. And um, yeah, it's nice to, to point that out, I think, yeah. I definitely appreciate it a lot more today. Thanks to your sharing. Colin, final remarks. Well, I think on the um, uh, back of um, ID for Africa, what I'm excited about is just the interaction after my talk yesterday. Um, I literally, I've run out of business cards. I, sp I had hundreds of conversations and we've been able to now set up um, various design workshops throughout East Africa and beyond. Um, so I'm going to have a, a busy um, few months ahead, uh, Moses, because, and this is something I'm passionate about, getting out into the territory, talking to the people, hearing their voice, and coming up with some, you know, you, we talked about these new emerging trends, um, representing these nations throughout Africa. I'm excited and passionate about that. Um, I want to open up that engagement throughout the, these different regions, hear those opinions, and collaborate together explore potential themes, ideas, modernize um, these, these books that have um, maybe lay dormant for the last 10 years and, and come up with some great new solutions for, for, the, for this region. And it's a region that I have been you know, exploring for the last 30 years and, and one of my uh, favorite, you know, well, my favorite continent here on earth. So uh, I can't wait to be back on African soil underneath this hot sun <laughs> and uh, yeah, and just enjoying that whole process of designing um, ID and passport documents for, the, for Africa. Well, thank you so much, Colin. Thank you, Natasha. It's been a real pleasure. I really feel schooled in all things <laughs> identity and passports and, and banknotes and all the detail that goes into that. I think for me, that's really why we do this podcast, to really want to sort of unpack and share in a very easy way things that are really interesting. And really, for me, the biggest excitement was, you know, encountering HID um, when I used my banking services and I was like, wow, I need to talk to these guys. I need to see what they're doing. So thank you so much for being on the podcast. Thank you all of us for joining us today to listen to the Pure Digital Passion podcast with Moses Kamibaro. We'll catch you in the next one. <laughs>